these two guys have Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Gentlemen, you smell the air? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, I do. That, what? What's up? Twins like, what is that? baseball. Twins baseball. Maybe that's why Judd coughed and hacked up a lung. <laughs> Is oh, in the wait. air. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> um, the Twins have reported to Fort Myers, Florida. We got pitchers and catchers as we record this episode of Mackie and Judd, Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment, Speculation, Therapy, whatever you need from us. Uh, twins pitchers and catchers working out today, and then I believe over the weekend, the rest of the position players will join. And uh, let's just call this our Mackie and Judd Twins 2023 season uh, preview, if you will. Or I guess uh, a chance for us to give our hottest takes and maybe even vent some frustration about where we're at here. I, I told you guys a couple days ago, is that, a, is that Brian Harper bobblehead? Brian Harper, yeah, 90, nice. 91 World Series bobblehead. Nice. I told you guys a couple days ago that even though my, my general feeling toward the Twins the last two years has been one of disgust and disappointment and... Just looking at them with, they're just like the disappointing child that can't mm-hmm. get out of its own way. You know, they keep signing broken pitchers and trading for broken pitchers, and they're trying to outsmart the system by, you know, pulling starters before the third time through the order for crappy relievers, and there's just, just a lot of things that have been pent up that we've talked about here. But I woke up a couple days ago, and I thought. I'm going to give this team an actual look here. I'm going to, I'm going to, let's take in everything they've done this off season. Let's go through pitching staff. Let's go through Correa. However it happened, Correa is back in a twins uniform. And I'll tell you, I, I want to see them prove it on the field. I'm not going to rush to the season ticket office and, uh, you know, dump a big lump sum of money to go watch all twins home games at target field. They have to earn my and our trust back to a large extent, but I'm a little bullish on this team, boys. I, 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 I come to you today with an open mind and clear eyes and an open heart when it comes to Twins baseball. That's where I'm at. I'm not like run through a wall excited, but yep. they've got my intrigue as you look up and down this roster. Where are you guys at? Um, Dex, go go ahead because I've got some I've got some actual. Th- therapy to dispense once you're done there's more okay. this is like when we need to like get everything put everything on the table yep. so we can De- proceed with the relationship kind the of man a who a year ago bought season tickets i'd like to hear his yeah they, they are trying i've getting handwritten letters i'm getting emails i'm getting voicemails they uh they want dex tweets his money back you? they are hey, they're the calls sure. back you get in your important. car and it's just, it's just a guy in a suit in a, in a twin hey, polo that- in your back seat hey, hey. Uh, <laughs> dave st <laughs> peter's back there oh god uh so Usually, like pitchers and catchers reporting is is a is a sign of optimism and time, just like opening day is for me. Like I, when opening day does hit here in like what six seven weeks, I will be excited for opening day. I think opening day still is of all the things that baseball continues to fail at and just go under the the cellar at the other with the other four major sports. There is still nothing like opening day, and I will be excited when opening day rolls around. That's going to be great. Um, I think my biggest question that still remains with this team is I am not buying that this is a better rotation and a rotation that fear that strikes fear in any type of lineup. I think this rotation, although it has depth, I don't think it has any ace in the hole. You are counting on guys over 30 to relive their glory days. Maybe someone like Bailey Ober you know, can come in and out, out, outperform his projections. Maybe Joe Ryan, there's another step, but I, I think he is who he was last year. That's kind of his ceiling, and it's a still solid pitcher. But I'm not buying that this starting rotation is all of a sudden one of the best and deepest in baseball. I think it's at best a mid-tier rotation in baseball. If we want to quantify that with ERA or however the hell we want to quantify that. But this rotation to me, it doesn't doesn't strike fear. I, I think they'd have to get better pitching before I am really bought in and kind of getting back into being a being into the twins like I was last year. So we're all right. All right. So I feel like I, I feel like sports dad has to chime in in here because you know kids I've had the same problems of late I've had the pangs of baseball like the beginning of spring training is exciting like it's hard to it, as a longtime baseball lover I think that's a fair word because I mm. I have loved the sport 
it's hard not to get excited about it. Like you see the trucks, you know, there's always the newspaper uh, has a picture of the trucks headed for Florida or Arizona, all the equipment's on board. It's going to be spring training, which starts off exciting. By the time it's done, I'm through with spring training, but it starts off exciting. And the twins, I think the temptation here is when you look at on paper, what they've done of all the American league central teams, they did a lot like, like they're, they're, off season in part because of the Correa thing, clearly, but you know what? It looks pretty proactive. So all of that being said, here's where, here's where I've given this a lot of thought so far. Cause I think that there is a cautionary tale here as well. Okay. Yeah. It's always exciting this time of year and you know, on paper or when you talk about the team, it's exciting to say Michael A. Taylor can replace Buxton when Buxton DH is blah, blah, blah. But then I start to think about the pitfalls and I start to think about the issues and I start to think about the things that deep in the summer make me despise this franchise of late. And it's things like this. Why do we think, why are we talking about Buxton as if there is not something at Target Field in Derek Falvey's office that probably says 100 games by a fingers crossed emoji? Um, The pitching again. We talked about this briefly yesterday, but Pablo Lopez had a very successful season in 2021 or 22 with the Marlins. Arise was traded for him, but there is a history of some arm issues there. And this team, like how many times have we been like, I'm buying in Tyler Malley is going to be great. Arm problems, you know, back to Sam Dyson, uh, back to Chris Paddock, who what barely got out of April if he did. So, I just caution you, and Phil, I'm in it the same boat because I think as three guys that love the sport, it's hard not to get caught up in the potential excitement. Um, There are things the Twins have done that deep in my heart make me so cynical and make me despise them that they need to overcome (laughs) those things in front of me before before I really invest as much as I would invest by being excited. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's 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 start with the. This is good. This is a good. I feel like we're gonna have to talk through some emotions here. You know, we've we've kind of. It's funny because you know we launched Score North four years ago in January of 2023, and this is pre-COVID. We actually had uh, ten full-time hosts and content creators and producers on staff, and then you know a year and a half later, COVID kind of derailed things. But we were we were doing a lot of live radio. We were doing. Uh, Purple Daily was a thing. Mackie and Joe was a thing. But like the, I would say the main show that that built our audience and the, I think the show that was probably the most fun throughout 2019 was the Score North Twin Show. It was a two hour daily twin show that, and it was live on the radio from like noon to two, and uh, it was podcastable. And we had a cast of characters. The three of us were part of it, and our guy Rami and Derek Wetmore. That's the most fun I can remember a twin season being in years. That 2019 Bomba Squad season. Every night, they're just bombs away. Two, three home runs. Mitch Garver, Eddie Rosario, you name it, right? Miguel Sano had like 35 bombs that year. And and even like from an audience interest standpoint, that show kind of carried us throughout 2019. I feel like ever since the Twins took the greatest home run hitting team of all time, to a playoff series and got walloped, did not win a game, and barely put up a fight offensively. Was that also, correct me, was that also the same postseason series where they ran Randy Dobnak out at Yankee Stadium in Game 2? Correct. Right. right? You're yeah. going to bring Randy Dobnak to Yankee Stadium with the greatest home run hitting team in baseball history. You know, it just, it, it, was a, it didn't make sense. And right. so I, I think us and a lot of fans, and then 2020, you know, we kind of, all right, let's do this again, right? And then they get smoked by the Astros or whoever it was. Yeah. Um, all of that, like my, ex- I guess I'm, what I'm saying is my excitement and interest, I think a lot of fans agree, peaked aggressively in 2019. And from there, it was it's just been this feeling of hollowness, this yep. feeling of what are you doing? And then the, some of the decisions that were made in the in the – three years after that. So I'm trying to shake some of that feeling off still, if I'm being honest, sounds like you guys are as well. But even as I shake some of that feeling off, going back to the rotation conversation, Sonny Gray, Joe Ryan, Tyler Malley, 
Pablo Lopez, who was healthy last year. Kenta Maeda is a couple years older, but he's coming back. And then you've got a stash of Bailey Ober has shown some flashes. Louis Varland has shown some flashes. Uh, Chris Paddock at some point, who's under team control. I'm not sure if you guys knew that. Cool. We'll be back at some point. This is, as a guy who covered Twins teams as a beat writer 10 years ago, like this is objectively the most solid rotation in at least 10 years that they have put on paper. I'm not saying it has a Max Scherzer. They probably still have to make a trade for a number one guy if they want to do damage in the playoffs. But at least they're not running out number four and number five starters that they don't trust to pitch you know, a second out in the fifth inning. So to me, it all starts there. The, the, the rotation is rock solid. Carlos Correa is very good. They now have a competent backup to Byron Buxton and Michael Taylor, who's a gold glove center fielder. They've, they're going to have one of the best outfield defenses. So, you know, emotionally, still a little bit pissed, still a little bit scarred. They missed their opportunity in 2019. They haven't won a playoff game in almost 20 years. Same old TC Bear franchise, right? <laughs> On the flip, oh, here's some new uniforms. Look over here, right? right? But on the flip side, this roster is a playoff roster on paper, if healthy enough. And that's kind of where I'm at here. You are far more willing to forgive and forget and move on than I am. Um, they have to show me so much. Rocco, Derek Falvey, um, I'm not convinced that you I'm not convinced that the powers that be, especially in season, are capable of not self-sabotaging things. And when I see that they are, that I and when I see that that has changed, I will change my ways. But Phil, you hit it perfectly. Game two of a playoff series in which it is a special year, in which you have to grab onto the opportunity that that was. I don't know exactly why, but I, I mean, I know from a home run standpoint why but that that team also had a special chemistry that was a special year and when you send out randy dobnik in game two convinced that this will work ah oh, it's fine and fans in yankee stadium i mean and that is a market where where it's not philadelphia but it's a tough one are chanting uber driver and randy dobnik because he's a human being is falling apart on the mound and that was your answer Ever since that day, the ability of Rocco Baldelli and Derek Falvey and probably to a certain degree, although I don't know how much, Thad Levine to sabotage themselves has astounded me. Absolutely astounded me. And they are, and I, I think I've broached this before with both of, of you guys on the show. They are the employee that you work with who says, I got this. I know what I'm doing. And at first you're like, oh, cool. A, a, a voice of reason, a veteran broadcaster, a veteran radio or podcast executive. And every time they take you down with them, they make a stupid decision. And like the first time, it, it's like, that's disappointing. I, I learned. But by the third time that you allow that, that's a you problem. And that's how I feel about Falvey and Baldelli and the overcompensating that they do to prove to me how smart they are that ends up screwing things up. So when I see that that has stopped, I and and not just with wintertime moves, when I see that has stopped in season, I will become much more open to loving again. But for now, <laughs> my heart is closed. My heart has shut off. Yeah. I don't have any more room for my child, the twins, to hurt me. I have had to, for my own good, draw a line. Well, I think okay. Let's 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 go deeper on one of the one of the self sabotaging things. I think that uh, that for sure drove me nuts, and it was third time through the order fear. Yes, it is true that when you face a lineup the third time through the order, they statistically have a much better chance of doing damage against your starting pitchers. So, undeniable fact, a hundred percent. But I think the Twins took that so far off the deep end. They decided, okay, this is a thing. The third time through the order is a thing, okay? So the way that we're going to respond to it is we're just going to avoid it, mostly, more than almost any team in baseball. In fact, I'll pull the numbers up here, but I'm pretty sure the Twins faced opposing teams a third time through the order uh, less than anybody else in the entire league. The problem is if you're going to pull starters and you're going to have starters pitch 
four innings, five innings, maybe sometimes six, but almost never seven, certainly never eight or nine. You're now putting more innings on your bullpen than any team in baseball, which is fine if you have a lights out bullpen and you have guys that can give you, you know, two or three innings at a time or guys that can bounce back and pitch back to backs, right? They didn't have durability. They didn't have depth. And so it's like, why would you go into the season planning full well, planning by signing Chris Archer and Dylan Bundy to pitch not very many innings as a starting staff and then not have a deep lights out bullpen to go with it? And where I will commend them is they seem to have realized and addressed this. So they go and get pitchers, Pablo Lopez being one of them, and they're going to get, you know, I guess they're going to get Maeda back, and we'll see what his innings load is going to look like. But they have pitchers that they can at least trust to go five, six, seven instead of four, five, six, and their bullpen, which is also the hardest throwing bullpen in Twins history. Um, it's a it's a strikeout machine bullpen. Duran, Lopez, Jorge Alcala is coming back. Uh, Griffin, Jacks, Emilio Pagan throws hard. I don't love that he's back, but he does throw hard. I guess they have a deeper, harder throwing bullpen than they've had ever. And they have more competent starters who can go deeper into games than they had last year. So it seems like they've realized that, okay, that gap where, what are we trying to do between the fourth and the sixth innings? They're trying to fix that at least over the last two or three months. So I will give them credit for that. And starting pitchers, you need a depth of them. Like I, I totally get there. It's a math game to get to the end of the season with how many starts you need, how many innings you need. And for sure, the Twins have enough arms, potentially even in a six-man rotation, to get them there to help make the burden less on the bullpen, to help them you know, have starting pitchers that are just honestly better. My bigger fear is is that by the time you roll into June and July and these guys that are veterans in, in Tyler Malley, Kenta Maeda, et cetera, you know, Pablo Lopez is still, he was 26 last year, so this is his age 27 season. So, I mean, there could be a next level to Pablo Lopez, I guess, if if you want to label him there. But my what would change my tune is if someone like Lopez, Louis Varland, Bailey Ober completely exceed the expectations. Not just a four-fifth guy that, you know, is going to make 20 starts that has to help you get to the math game at the end of the season. Can one of those three guys, mostly the Varlins and the Obers, et cetera, can they exceed the expectations? Can they turn the key and not just be a fourth guy in the rotation, but all of a sudden, oh my gosh, this guy actually is a legit ace. And by the way, a homegrown talent that they haven't been able to develop at this position in decades and in this regime at all. That would be that was what would get me to change my tune. I think the rotation has enough to get them to the end of the season. But we're going to be in the same boat, in my opinion, if there's no addition and if there's no uh, big rise because we've had the same thing about playoff rotations with Twins teams for years where they have been afraid to add because, oh, well, Carl Pavano's been fine. Oh, Jake Odorizzi's been fine. They have yet to really make an addition or have anyone step up that can be the ace that they've been desperately looking for for years. Sports dad. I mean, he's totally right. Uh, I, I just, I guess I keep coming back to, to this. They have to, in, in what Dex just t- talked about, which is, you know, um, Derek Falvey was hired from Cleveland because his because he knew how to develop or had a pipeline to pitching. Um, that didn't mean that he had to continually, and he's done this now, go out and trade for or pick up pitchers. That meant, you know, the pitching would be coming through the, through the pipeline. It was going to be great. We haven't really seen that yet. Um, I, I have to, there's so many things I have to see. And, and I guess I'm frustrated, Phil. And I be, I think you guys are too, but here's the other thing that frustrates me. And I think it's the market and I think it's people in our end of the business as well. Okay. But there seems to be this weird blind trust in teams and executives who don't earn it that we don't talk about enough. Okay. Number one, a year ago, we found out only because their feet were to the fire that this team at some point in the winter of 2022 had basically come up with a 100-game goal for Buxton. So here's my question. What's that goal now? Like, is that goal? And and is that goal, okay, if we can get them 100 games, let's say we get them 25 at DH. Well, Michael A. Taylor is really good in the outfield, but he's not Buxton as far as at the plate potentially. So like, I want to know that. What are your intentions? You've done nothing for me to give you my trust. Okay. I want to know what you're going to do. Just tell me up front. 
Well, don't you think you... the goal is probably still 100 games? No, that's probably right, but I want to know that. But what I'm saying is I want to know what your intentions are here as far as this. Here's another one that hasn't been broached at all. And I don't mind the contract one bit. I think it's a fortunate stroke of G- of, of luck for the Twins. But you know what no one has brought up? And and everyone now who's a Twins fan is just like, oh, they're uh, no, I, I, no, he chose us. Carlos Correa. I don't care who the doctor was. My guess is it wasn't a whack job, but a doctor looked at an impression of his leg and said, uh, this is a problem. Okay. Now the twins got a good deal because of that. So I'm not saying they shouldn't have brought him back, but that has gotten no discussion. And everyone, including the twins are just like, well, we took him back. Our doctor said it's fine. Okay. I'm going to say this very slowly. Who are the Minnesota Twins to tell me that their doctors are like, our doctor said it's fine. Well, your doctors also thought that Tyler Malley, I guess, was fine. Your doctors also, yes, passed. And and keep in mind, before you're like, oh, typical Zolgad, the New York Mets turned down a paddock trade. They had that trade done. And they bailed on it because of what their doctor saw. So before we say, Correa's never had a problem, and I hope he doesn't. I hope he's great. But my point is, who are you to tell me to trust you? I think, I mean, I agree. I, I am. Where's just the cynicism a, just, of some sort? Well, we are cynical. I think it's, no, I, I, think, we are. I think we come off as being overly cynical sometimes on this show. But, you know, I think it's a chance that you take either way, right? I if agree. someone said, hey, uh, but no one's Cor- talking. Correa might be damaged goods, you'd say. It's like saying, oh, there's a there might be a storm coming. Well, okay. Well, can we get a, you know, can we get some uh, grocery shopping in? Can we go get a game of pickup hoops in before the, I don't see any rain clouds. That's how I'm feeling with Correa. Oh, there's an ankle storm coming. Right. Okay. Well, he's 28 and he's awesome and appears to be moving just fine. And so I'm until just, until I see something with my own two eyes, and it's not a 15 year contract, it's a six year contract. I I like the contract, but my point is there seems to be this over there. There's too much confidence of it's fine. There's no problem here. My my point is no, he was failed by two teams that desperately wanted him healthy. And again, I'll come back to this: it's doctors I don't trust. Yeah. If the if the Twins team doctors were Declan Goff or Phil Mackey's family doctors, you would have bailed on them two years ago. <laughs> I'm getting a new doctor. So my, But my point is, our guys passed him. Okay, your guys have passed a lot of guys that I wouldn't have passed. We had I'm a family just, doctor one time about 20 years ago, my my, my dad who, who died of lung cancer last, he, he, he got lung cancer the first time like 20 years ago, mm-hmm. had a doctor tell him, you have two months to live. Your cancer has progressed. You have two months to live. And we literally were like on the phone with each other, like kind of crying, like, oh my God, should we travel somewhere? Which he's like, I feel fine. It's weird. And then another doctor said, oh, uh, actually, it was just some scar tissue that they saw in the original uh, workup. Wow. It's like, so <laughs> maybe the tw- maybe these other doctors are like that first doctor. Oh my God, Carlos Correa, you have three months they to live. The- You're done. And the twins doctors the are like, no, he's fine. What this isn't you- good. <laughs> Um, let's, okay, let's, let's get back into this in a second, because I think no matter what, there might be a, a smaller window here than we think based on, you know, you look at the age of Korea, sure. looks like you have a 10 year window, maybe it's a smaller window. And I have a point to make on that, but I do have an admission to make to you guys here today. Uh, my name is Phil and, uh, I oh. recently have suffered from dull kitchen knives. Oh, I know. Mm. I know Mm-mm. the shame the embarrassment trying to slice tomatoes and they just squish and squirt because oh. the knives aren't sharp and enough. it slips uh, the knife slips sort of too and, yeah. and it doesn't even cut Dangerous. you because it's not sharp right. You, know, right you know when your knife slips and it goes across your hand and your finger just laughs at the knife that you know your knives are probably pretty dull you got to get those sharp and just like skate blades bit it is it's it's tough going out in public you know the, i see the finger pointing the last that guy's yeah. got dull that guy's got that dull, knives. Got dull knives yeah look at that guy Seattle with this dull knife. Hot yeah. takes, but dull knives. And that's why I am thrilled to have discovered MyDullKnives.com. MyDullKnives.com, where the folks at Vivrant will send you a safe and professional mail kit to send your little dull knives on a vacation. An oasis of sharpening professionally 
You get your knives back in just a few days. They'll send you replacement knives as well uh, while your knives are on their sharpening vacation. If you've never had your knives sharpened, and most people haven't, it is a game-changing experience. More confidence in the kitchen. Uh, my wife and I are spending a lot more time making our own meals at this point, and so I have no longer walking out into the streets of Minneapolis in shame or the streets previously of Seattle. <laughs> I am confident in my sharp knives thanks to MyDullKnives.com. The next 50 to order with the promo code SCORE, S-K-O-R, receive your fifth knife sharpened for free. That's MyDullKnives.com. Beautiful. So the Twins rotation that I am high on, but you guys are a little bit skeptical about, I'm not like World Series high on it, just to be clear. But, you know, these guys, are Joe Ryan's pretty young, but Tyler Malley has had some issues. Sonny Gray's contract is going to be up, and so is Tyler Malley's, by the way. Uh, Pablo Lopez, I think, is part of your plan. What's he under team control for a couple more years? Maeda's almost 40, for God's sakes. But you're not exactly looking at a crop of five 23-year-old starters here. Maybe maybe some younger guys, and they do have a farm system that is starting to pop again, but maybe Bailey Ober, Louis Varland. But I guess with this collection of starters, it's kind of a short-term window with contracts and age. With Carlos Correa, apparently he has a ticking time bomb in his ankle, so maybe you got like a three-year window with him playing at a high level. Maybe it's two. We don't really know. Maybe it is six, but let's call it three. Byron Buxton is a lot closer to 30 than he is 20 at this point. Yep. yep. And, you know, every year that goes by with more injuries and you get older, the speed, he's, he's not as fast now as he was five years ago. And so I do love if some of these guys can stay healthy. I mean, they, the young stable of position players they have with Royce Lewis, who we barely see play because he's hurt, um, Alex Kirilov, who could be one of the best hitters in baseball if his wrist can react, Jose Miranda has torn up the minor leagues, Larnick. I mean, those guys are nice, but it kind of feels like with Buxton, Correa, Joey Gallo, Michael Taylor, Jorge Polanco, like the main core players who are – who are propping this thing up and the starting pitching that this, this is kind of a 2023, maybe a 2024 window until you have to really start looking at resetting your starting rotation and et cetera. So I almost feel like there's pressure this year to do something noteworthy to, I don't know, win your first playoff game. I feel like there, that's where I kind of have an issue with, I don't know if it's like the coverage or whatever, but it kind of feels like, all right, well, the, the Twins have missed the playoffs the last couple of years, and like maybe they can be competitive this year. It's like we've lowered the bar so far here mm -hmm. with our standards. The expectation the last two years was playoffs, and they came well short. Just because they came well short the last two years doesn't mean that we should lower our bar and expectations for this team. To me, the expectation yeah. is the the thing that they've put together here on paper, and they have a pretty pretty decent sized payroll. They should win ninety games. They should win the division, or at least come close, and they should win at least a playoff game and probably their first playoff series since 2002. Like I'm still setting a pretty high expectation for this thing, just based on everything I just said. And don't forget they fell apart last year. Like that was a lousy division. That, that was a division that was, you know, eminently winnable. They led it for a lot of the season and then they didn't struggle. They came apart unglued completely. And so, yeah, they, they definitely deserve to be held to an expectation. Um, and I think that this season is really going to help tell a story, though, of, OK, the division's probably improved, but it's certainly not going to, to be great. Making the playoffs should not be an act of God at this point. But this is going to be their chance again to prove that they have the infrastructure, that they have the manager, that they have the uh, president of baseball operations to also make the right moves at the right time and not screw them up and not get a guy who's hurt because you're taking a chance. So, like, there are a lot of things. The In the end, it will be interesting because one of potentially the best things that could have happened possibly is that not only Correa playing-wise, but I don't think Scott Boris is joking or Falvey was joking when they talked about how much he is basically going to tell them what he wants to see done. And I don't know that Derek Falvey is going to tell Carlos Correa no. Like the whole Boris Correa thing, I think in in a weird way because ordinarily this is a this is a very odd thing to suggest being good, but I think it might be. That whole dynamic, I think, is you're going to have a couple of pretty smart baseball guys telling Falvey, "You got to do this or do that." And I don't think with a six year contract now, Carlos Correa, 
who didn't hold his tongue a year ago is going to hold his tongue at all. My guess is he would go, go in and and present a pretty stern lecture to Baldelli or Falvey. Well, so I actually think the pseudo GM thing might be might be more than than a joke, and I I have no problem with that. I don't want him running the franchise, but I I like the fact that he like last year he made noise starting in like late May, early June, he was giving recommendations. To the, I, I had heard this behind the scenes that he was giving recommendations to the front office on yeah. the things that they need to address at the trade deadline. You know, I don't think they should be like consulting with him. Like, hey, Carlos, what do you think of this? I think they should just be aggressive. They should be like, when he, he doesn't want to do their jobs, but he wants to win a world series. Mm-hmm. And um, if, if it means like making it clear from his you know spot in the clubhouse to the front office that he wants them to be aggressive. I'm I'm absolutely okay with that. Let me ask you another question, you guys. So the tw- the twins don't seem particularly perturbed by anything that happened last year in terms of like coaching staff or front office, right? I mean they you know they had the ownership tweak where they're going from Jim Polad to Joe Polad, the third generation of Polads. But he's been around day-to-day operations for years and years. It's not like he's stepping in from California here. You know, like he, Joe's been around for several years, so that's not even really that big of a change. Sure, no major front office changes, no coaching staff changes outside of Wes Johnson leaving halfway through the year. No managerial change. The Twins are essentially chalking last year up to bad luck, injuries, and there were a lot of injuries. But they're basically saying, hey, if we would have ran that whole thing back with the same structure, same leadership, everything, and just been a little healthier, we would have been like 15 games better, and we would have done what we had set out to do and made the playoffs. Um, Do you guys think anyone is on the hot seat in the first half of 2023 or at any point in 2023? Not from our perspective. I'm saying from from Joe Polad all the way down. Do you think... 2023 is a prove it year for Rocco or for Derek Falvey. I don't think so. Um, again, personally, I feel their pers- completely their perspective, different. Yeah. But you're asking me to put my to put my uh, feet in the lo- loafers, the Gucci's of the pole ads. No, I don't think so. I think it should be. He's a Vans guy. I think, I think okay, a Vans yeah, guy. I think yeah, yeah. Nike or Vans. I think it should be. Um, I think it should be for Rocco for sure. But no, I don't think anyone until like if you look at the patience through the years of this franchise or the monumental collapse that, you know, that it takes for them to make a move. My answer would be from their perspective. No, I don't. Maybe Rocco. I, to be honest, the whole injury thing last year, I thought was a load of crap. Um, the guys that spent the most time on the injured last last year were Miguel Sano, who has just been a failed prospect. Jorge Alcala was lost. Um a lot of their core players outside of, I would say, you know, the Kirloff injury was unfortunate, but also at the same time, like, can that guy even stay healthy? Trevor Larnick, too. Correa missed some time. Bucks admit, like, injuries are just going to happen. Like, they're going to happen throughout the course of a season. Right. I think the injury debate and the fact of, oh, if, if these four, five, six, seven, eight, nine guys didn't get hurt, we, we are 15 games better. Well, you're not going to spend the entire year without having injuries to at least someone of your core player. Um, but to answer your question, I think if there's anyone going to be on the hot seat between Falvey and Rocco, I'd probably scale it more towards Rocco. I think this brain trust really trusts Falvey a lot. And judging from even what I know about Joe Polad and from what the recent athletic article article came out, Joe Polad and Falvey are, are, are very tight. So I think it would take a lot to break up that relationship. And I think it's a lot easier to make the scapegoat on the manager if we do have to go down a path where who receives more blame. I think it's more likely it'd be Rocco than it would be Falvey. I agree. I think I think Joe Polad, and I, I'm just this is sort of just educated speculation here. I think Joe and the family view Derek Falvey in the way that they viewed Terry Ryan for years, like the previous generation of Polads. That he is our guy. We trust him. We're not going to get handsy or meddle. And even through some dark years, he is the compass for this organization. I do think that that's the way um, that they feel about Derek Falvey. Um, you know, on the what was the other point you were making before that? You were talking about Joe. You were talking about oh the injuries. Yeah, the injuries. injuries. What bothered me about it's yes, the Twins got hammered by injuries. I think what bothered me the most was a lot of the big ones. 
you saw coming from a mile away and should have planned better for, right? Like Byron Buxton doesn't play a hundred games, right? Like he does, like at no point in his career going into a season and hoping that he plays 120 or 125 games, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> and so they got smacked upside the head again by the Byron Buxton injury bug. And their answer in center field was like, Oh, uh, J cave, uh, Celestino, yeah. like just these incompetent non-major league players. Right. And finally now, and Judd, you've been asking for this for years. Can you go find a Jackie Bradley or just like someone who can play center field at a high level? And Michael Taylor fits that bill. Mm -hmm. And then the pitchers. Oh, well, Chris, what are you supposed to do? Chris Paddock got hurt. And then you trade for Tyler Mallon. He got hurt. And, 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 you know, our point has always been, yeah, well, like you knew, like literally Chris Paddock had a UCL tear at the end of the season, the year, the year before. So, so planning ahead, if you know that a guy, oh, there's, Probably a seventy-five percent chance that this dude's going to spend some significant time on the on the injured list. You should be planning for that. They've planned better for those things this year. Um, my next question for you guys is Joey Gallo. So Carlos Correa was their big offseason move. Joey Gallo was like the I guess Pablo Lopez was the second one, and then Joey Gallo was kind of the third big move. Yep. Do you think? We're going to see a resurgence of the best version of Joey Gallo when he was kind of tucked away in Texas, you know, no New York media spotlight. His 2019 season in Texas, and he only played 70 games, but he was an all-star. He had a 986 OPS, 22 home runs in just 70 games. And then there was the COVID season, which he was fine, but uh, he, he, was, he won a gold glove and he was okay. 2021. First half in Texas before he gets traded to New York. 870 OPS, 25 home runs in 95 games, and then the wheels came off under the pressure of New York, which we, you know, we've seen that before with guys. Right. Do you think the Twins just picked up a guy that's going to be a dud like he was in New York, or do you think they picked up a guy that could be one of the best power hitters in baseball and be a huge boost to, uh, to what they're trying to do here? I think he's going to hit 25, 25 to 30, probably more 25 home runs. I think he's going to strike out a ton. And I think as far as a ball player, he's a far more competent Sano because Sano was a disaster in the field. Um, and his at bats were probably he they they strike out about the same, but his at bats, Sano's at bats were probably worse at times. Uh I think it's going to be a decent pickup, but I mean, I'm not expecting like this transformational player. Uh yeah, I think playing, I, I mean. My God, he was a miserable failure with the Yankees, which is a big ask for a guy like that. And then he gets traded to the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, there's less pressure, but he's still in the spotlight. So I think he rebounds. It's preferable. I would far rather have Joey Gallows at bats and glove, especially than Miguel's. But I also don't think it's going to be this, you know, my, oh my God, he's back to being an all-star. I'd be very surprised if he gets back to that. But I don't think it's going to be the complete and utter disaster that he was for the Yankees. I made my stance very clear on Joey Gallo last summer. Uh, but this is also, to me, kind of a classic Twins reclamation project. Let's pick up a guy and pluck him on our roster who was super good six years ago. That was a super prospect that kind of has flamed out and is not that much, uh, not much of a relevant player anymore. Do I think he can contribute and get some at-bats and, to Judd's point, basically be a better Miguel Sano, which is an awfully low bar uh, or a, a bar that we want to clear? Like, that's a, that's a pretty low bar for him. I think he can be a fine, serviceable outfielder. And to be honest, if it if it comes down to Max Kepler continuing to be a regression player and someone who has just completely now fallen off the map post-Bomba squad, I probably would take my at-bats and give those to Gallo, knowing that hey, at least one in every three or four is probably going to end with a bomb instead of Max Kepler, who pops up all the time and rolls all over a bunch of ground balls. But to me, he's not a difference maker going into this season. That's where I'm at with him. Yeah, I th well, I think you you can't, like, again, hope is not a strategy. So you can't, you can't be, oh, my God, we hope Joey Gallo goes back to the guy that he was in Texas, and then we can make the playoffs. Um, we hope that Byron Buxton can play 125 games, and then we make the playoffs. That That makes me a little uneasy. But it is interesting that if some of these things do happen, and this is why I'm open-minded about this team, if Buxton has the healthiest season of his career, if Joey Gallo goes back to being the guy that he was in Texas, all of a sudden now the complexion of this offense and this team's upside are completely different. 
Um, Joey Gallo defensively, you kind of nailed it. You know, Miguel Sano and Gallo are very similar hitters. One's a lefty, one's a righty, but uh, they're both going to strike out a ton. Historical strikeout rates. They're yep. both going to hit a bunch of home runs, and they're both going to hit like 200. You can maybe draw some walks. But the biggest difference is Miguel Sano is a largely terrible defensive player. Mm-hmm. And Gallo is actually one of the better corner outfielders in baseball. He's not like Byron Buxton level in terms of roaming the pasture, but he's a very, very good fielder in left and right field. Smart player. Mm-hmm. He can run the bases. Imagine that. Like the <laughs> Twins have had some of the stupidest base ru- running in the past couple of years. Joey Gallo can go from first to third without it being a freaking adventure. So I'll take that. And uh, I mean, those bigger bases are supposed to also increase in theory or are supposed to increase the stolen base rate uh, for, for, a, for, a, for a sport that has had the stolen base go completely away. I mean, the, the art of the stolen base is like, to me, gone. Like the, the guys that steal 50 bases now, like it just yeah. doesn't exist. And hopefully some of those bigger bases, if you will, uh, will increase some of that too. Here's a crazy stat for you guys in terms of outfield defense. Over the last three seasons among qualified outfielders, the top two outfielders in baseball, defensive runs saved uh, versus average, are Michael Taylor and Joey Gallo. Mm-hmm. And Buxton would be on here if he had played more. Which but help uh, your pitching. Yes. So that's another thing to... Absolutely. To, just kind of crazy. What warms my heart about the upcoming season is not the twins it's the rule changes i have hope of going to a ball game and getting out of there in under three hours <laughs> pitch clock helped a and lot not, i the guess pitch clock the knocked strength. like 20 minutes off the average minor league game time exactly like, right but but i mean if you think about if you think about the fact that that you know if all goes according to plan the shift will not be nearly as um as exploited or seen as it was previously, the pitch clock's going to knock time off. They're going to enforce some rules. Like that's what, that's what I'm, I'm excited about going to target field and actually seeing a normally timed baseball game, as opposed to these obnoxious, you know, three 30 yeah. and it's two to one. Dude, that's I actually my, think that's my problem. I think even like, this is maybe part of my twins bullishness a little bit is I think the lack of, uh, shifts, and I know you brought up that there might be some teams that try and game the system by you can't move infielders, but maybe you move an outfielder over or something. Yep. Um, but I do think if if they're if the floodgates open up a little bit more, especially for left-handed hitters, Max Kepler and Joey Gallo are going to mm-hmm. be two guys that absolutely benefit from a batting average standpoint and an yeah. on-base standpoint. The Twins have some guys that are like, thank God, there's not going to be. You know, an automatic out when I hit a laser to the <laughs> shallow right field area. So, true. Um, last question for you here on our and we and, and we'll you know we'll talk twins uh, throughout spring training. We'll probably talk a lot of twins with Royce too on those episodes. But gun to the head, if there was some crazy situation where someone put a gun to your head and said, "I need an accurate twins prediction here," do you think this is the year that they finally win a playoff game? I'm I'm so done trying to speak this into existence. Um, I just I, I'm gonna just say no because because if I, I'm I'm just gonna assume the worst and hope for the best. That is where that is where I'm at with this franchise. If they can break that streak, my God, I will be jacked if that happens. And that that is also kind of sad that that's the bar. But that that's where we're at here. Yeah. I was 11. I'm now 30. Win a damn playoff game. So I I think 85 <laughs> wins. That's where I'm that's at, dude. Hilarious, dude. God. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if I, I could say that I even think they're going to make the playoffs. So the answer to me is no. And the answer will become will become much more um, encouraging from my, my point of view if in season for the first time in a long time, this team can prove it doesn't have two left feet, so it trips over them constantly. No. You know, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm not there. I think it is, guys. I think we get her. I think we get her done. Well, then on Wednesday, we get got, her done. We then get on a Wednesday, you, then on Wednesday, you put that on the record. That's right. I might have to. I might. I, yeah, put your I, money I probably will. Your mouth is. The Twins are the man. I probably will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think. I think they're going to need at some point. They're going to need another reliable lefty in the bullpen. They're going to need a, a true number one starter to emerge or to be traded for, and they're going to need. I think. Uh, the, like the the. I think Correa is going to be healthy this year. I think. I think the ankle's not really a thing this year, but. Buxton, 
120 plus games and be ready at the end of the year. And then I think like of the five young, they have sort of five young players who have yet to reach their ceiling. Kirilov, Jose Miranda, Trevor Larnick, Royce Lewis, and I'll throw Nick Gordon in there too because he's a, he was a top five overall pick. Yeah. People have lowered the bar so much on Nick. Oh my God, he's Utility he hits player. 270 and gets on yep. base at a 320 clip and can play some positions. Like play dude, that was a top five pick, five man. Pick. Yeah, that's yeah. That's so can can three of those five guys break out in 2023? Can you get a breakout from? You know, Kirilov, Miranda, who showed a little bit of flash last year, and Royce Lewis at some point, and then Gordon's a good utility guy, and Buxton gives you 120 games. Like, now we're talking. When's Royce Now Lewis you're back? winning a playoff game. When, when do we think he's back? I don't think he's uh, – he's definitely not full go right now, right? It'd be like a second yeah. half of the I mean, season Buxton, kind of a situation. Uh, Buxton at 120 at this point would be a miracle. Yeah. It'd be I a know. nice one. but it, a lot of and, and Kirilov's arm might – come off for all we know we have no idea well his like arm will the... remain attached it's the wrist that would come off judd okay okay his the elbow's wrist. fine no, his he shoulder's might just take fine. the whole thing off you, you know what he needs the six million dollar man surgery where they soup up his arm so it's uh <laughs> it's, it's some type of new arm i i can't like yes that's a lot of great ifs but i can't get that no. excited about it yet um Sorry. one thing that is not a hypothetical the tom bernard morning show has come Ooh. to the Hubbard umbrella. And this is kind of cool. It's kind of crazy to even be, because I used to, as a kid, I used to listen. I'm sure you're the same way. Like mm-hmm. Tom Bernard is a legend. Driving to high town. school. Driving when to he elementary school. KQ. For when me. he started at KQ. <laughs> and Tom has been, uh, and, and I think there's there's been some rumors, is he retiring? He is not retiring. He is going to be heard again every single morning starting Monday, February 20th. And you can hear Judd, and myself at 9.15 every day on the new Tom Bernard Morning Show, TomBernardShow.com, TomBernardShow.com, podcastable, everything, uh, and uncensored as well. So I want to hear, are you going to be uncensored? When you go and talk sports at 9.15, I don't know if I can on Mondays sure. and Fridays, you're going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Are you going to drop some F-bombs, or what's going to happen? It depends on the tone, but if he drops an F-bomb, I'm, like, I, I, I'm not dying to drop a bunch of them. But I mean, you could keep it clean on in. this show. But I mean, if he wants yeah. to, if he wants to spar with uh, some bad words, you know, maybe maybe Judd will take him on that. We just went forty seven minutes talking about the twins, and I didn't swear. So like, yeah. if, if if you guys get a <laughs> twins conversation like this with Tommy B, you have to at least for me because I it took it took a couple times for me to hold back a couple words that I wanted to say on this podcast. <laughs> Tommy B used to be a huge Twins fan. In in fact, when when he started on KQ, I'm pretty sure that he had season tickets at the Dome. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun to yeah, it'll be fun to jump on with him on a daily basis. The the Score North Sports Report at nine fifteen, but that's a Tom Bernard Show dot com. Phil Mackey then... here with the scores from last night. <laughs> Please Twins, you. Yeah. Twins yeah. two, <laughs> Brewers one. <laughs> Amazing. All right, that's uh, that's, I guess that's kind of our twin season preview here going into yeah. spring training, and we'll mix in some more Twins talk as we go forward. Some people have asked, you guys have Judd's Hockey Show, you got Flagrant Howls. You know, when are you going to bring back the Score North Twin Show? It's up to the twins, man. If it the really twins, is. you know, the wolves came out and said, we're going to make a big blockbuster. We're going to go to the playoffs, make a blockbuster trade for, uh, for Rudy Gobert. Okay. You're interesting. Let's, we'll launch a new show we're, you know, we're a three person yeah. staff here, so we don't want to stretch ourselves too thin. All right. We got to run Mackie and Judd daily Minnesota sports entertainment. We'll see you guys.